everyone, it's lovely to see you. Thanks for inviting me along to this. Um, yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work. So, my name is Dai, I'm an artist, and I look at um, the body, movement, and sound. So, those are the three things that really drive my work. Um, about ten years ago, um, I actually used to be a fashion designer once upon a time, and about Ten years ago, I, I set off on a journey to explore how digital technology might be integrated into clothing and on the body, and how that might shape our perception of the body and idea of the body for the future. So, so yeah, this, this, I went on this kind of epic odyssey, um, uh, exploring how technology might be integrated in, into the wearable sort of... And so I went from Banff to Montreal, where I made kinetic dresses, to Boston, to Rotterdam, New York, and finally landed at Queen Mary University, where I started collaborating with students from the Centre for Digital Music and the Media Arts and Technology Group. And together, I developed these kind of playful, wearable musical instruments with them. And that's what I've been doing for the last six years, um, integrating all their kind of amazing technology. Um, so, in London, I work from a place called the Village Underground on the roof here, where I have a nice little kind of potting shed, where I collaborate with the students and we make, kind of, we make new instruments and we test them out and quite often work with dancers to develop them so that they're body-centric. Um, so, the reason I'm here today is to tell you about the Human Heart Project, which um, is the project that I've been working on for the last two years. And um, the story behind it is I was doing a residency in New York City and I lived there for a year and um, I became quite fixated with the Brooklyn Bridge. And at around about tea time every day, I'd leave my studio and I'd go for a walk to the bridge and I found myself being captivated by the different sounds that I could hear. Um, I'd sort of nestle by one of the towers, cross-legged, cross and um, there's a lovely wooden pedestrian walkway there and I'd, I'd listen to all the lovely sounds of vibrations, the sounds of traffic, which is down below, which is kind of humming drone, the sound of people, conversations, different languages, languages merging, and the wonderful clonking sound of footsteps along this hard wooden walkway. And I wondered if all of these journey vibrations were somehow traveling through the cable of the bridge and whether there was a way of creating a clip-on instrument that could be attached to the cables and pick up these kind of subsonic vibrations and make them audible. And so, um, but most of all, at that point, I was just very, I became kind of obsessed with the idea that the bridge was in fact a giant harp. And um, so when I came back to London, I started drawing pictures of shadowy figures attached to the bridge via colourful musical strings. And I wasn't quite sure why I was doing this, but soon enough, the walls of my studio were covered with these drawings. And one day, a couple of years ago, I did some research and I discovered that the 130th anniversary of the Brooklyn Bridge was coming up. And I decided this was my chance. And so I wanted to make my daydream a reality. So I spent the last of my Queen Mary money on a, on a ticket to New York. And um, I went up there, um, went out there to kind of really talk to people in New York and soak up the atmosphere and just say, how would you feel about transforming your magical bridge into a giant harp? which most people responded to in a kind of like positive way. Um, and so also at the same time, I became really interested in the history behind the bridge and started learning about the Roeblings who, who built the bridge. And um, full of sort of enthusiasm and perhaps a little bit too enthusiastic, I decided to pay a visit to the Department of Transport and pitch my idea to them. And so I came clasping my sketches and went up to the 15th floor and met a lady called Emily with a poker face. And I told her, <laughs> I told her my idea, um, which she thought was you know, whimsical and fun. But then when I mentioned that we'd be attaching strange objects, foreign objects to the cables of the bridge, she looked a bit startled. And I realized that this was going to be a difficult task with lots of kind of red tape, potentially. And so as I walked along the bridge, a tiny bit crestfallen on the way back, home, I suddenly realized that this project could no longer be just about me, an artist, trying to do a sound installation on a bridge. I had to perhaps look at the word bridge and use it for my process, thinking about how working with different 
artists, scientists, engineers, different laboratories, different university, and bridging and pooling our resources and our ideas, perhaps there'd be a chance to actually get permission to do things on this scale and be able to realise the project. So I came back to London with loads of enthusiasm and I spoke to Mark Plumley at the Centre for Digital Music at Queen Mary's and I said, please, will Queen Mary's help me kickstart this idea? And Mark was up for it. And so a group of us were gathered of kind of researchers from Queen Mary's and also people from startups in East London. And we set about designing the first human harp instrument. So I'd come back with these kind of sketches because I thought it seemed to make sense that the instrument was somehow modular so that by attaching it to the source of the sound, so in this case the string of the harp or the cable of the bridge, um, you'd then be able to pull a string and the sound of that cable would then be audible. Um, so this was just a kind of a doodle and I also thought it was important that the, the instrument could take on the shape and form of all sorts of different bridges so that it wasn't just something that we had to go into a box at the, end of, at the end of it. It could go on and be sustainable and have a life beyond one bridge. And so I hooked up with um, an industrial designer called David Blair Ross and in East London we started making the first um, human heart player as we called it then. And so um, the, the um, Becky Stewart, Adam Stark, and John Nussie um, all have startups in East London, and they helped me um, develop this first version. And the idea being that by pulling a string in our, our device, so imagine it's similar to a hacked dog lead, by pulling a string you could release the sounds, and um, by we were using sensors that could measure the, the speed at which you pull the string, the length of the string, and also the angles of the string. And so we made eight of these um, players in a way, I guess, a portable mixing device. And we used samples that we'd gathered from the bridge and took them to New York um, just before the night before the anniversary. Um, so when we got in, first of all, we met up with um, a group called Creators Project and demonstrated the idea to them. So they said they'd help us get the project off the ground by making a nice documentary. Um, then um, Holly, my friend um, who I call a musician, somebody who composes music um, through movement, um, she and I bundled off to the bridge. I decided to hire a director of photography to come and film us and, um, uh, and we decided to take, take the gamble and go up onto the bridge and hopefully wouldn't get arrested. And um, so we decided to make a film that would um, show everyone what it would be like to play a bridge. And so this is what it's like. question was what do we do now really we would sort of showed what this instrument how it might work and we would put it out online and it was getting loads and loads of interest online and so I, I suddenly realized that this project wasn't over it was really just in its infancy and now we had to answer the next question which was how do we actually gather the the, the vibrations and the sounds from the cables and so we did an experiment with my mate um, Andy Cavatorta who makes musical instruments <coughs> and John Kors who's a sound engineer and artist and we um, got some contact mics and I was given the job of doffing the cable and um, John recorded it and this was the result. Um, 
Um, so yet again, the question was, what's next? How do we keep the project going? And so um, what I realized is what would be really nice is to start playing with our instruments and learning how to use them. And it was at this point that the Roundhouse venue in London invited us to do an open pop-up lab in, in their space throughout the month of August. And so the team were gathered again, the London team, and um, actually a, a member, Seb Madgwick, who's from Bristol, who some of you might know, um, he worked on the tech for the next version, which was even prettier than the one before, which was here. And um, we decided that if we could use um, this player to play a suspension cable, then perhaps it would even play the columns, the lovely metal columns that hold up the roof of the roundhouse. So we set up a new device with a kind of mechanical piano donging device on it that would hit the, hit the cables. And so um, it, we, we had this lab and we had people, um, there was a footfall of like 35,000 or something throughout the month of August. And we there was loads of us there and we'd really hoped to like all collaborate together, all the scientists and the artists and the dancers. But all we were doing is like really dealing with the, with the public, which was in a way wonderful just to see these things that you'd made in the hands of people, like, you know, kids instantly trashing them. And you're like, hmm, that, that bit of industrial design needs improving. Now I know. And yeah, just the, the things, yeah, learning so much about what people like and, and what's working and what's not. And so, yeah, we invited harpists over and all sorts of people and even had the opportunity to play, play the actual building on a couple of evenings. And so um, this, then after that, I was feeling really overdosed on digital and decided um, I got invited to do a residency in Omaha. <laughs> and, um, and so they have a wonderful bridge in Omaha called Bob Kerry Suspension Bridge. And I really just spent every day sort of running to the bridge and like having fresh air and literally getting to know the bridge and the sounds it makes. And the, it was a bit of a looker, the bridge. It was really nice. <laughs> Had two fins. And then I made friends with all sorts of interesting characters um, and uh, musicians and, and we did lots of experiments. And I. It was just really lovely just to be quite loose and answer some of the physics questions that I hadn't understood, like how the structure of the bridge sort of affects the sounds that we hear and the, the thickness of the cables and the, the material you hit it with. And so all these kind of things I was learning. And we even got a harpist up there at some point. So, um, and on the final night, we, um, we shot somebody actually playing the harp on the bridge. And um, a local sound artist made this a piece, um, which you can hear on SoundCloud. I won't play it now. So, um, what I came away with from Omaha was really that what the project needed was this kind of physical element. Up until now, we've been so focused on this digital um, device, which is now singing, all singing, all dancing. It works incredibly well. But now, how do we get the sound in the first place? So, started thinking about bows, like rotating bows, or, or the bows of a hurdy-gurdy, like a circular bow, and how these could be operated from cables, similar retractable cables. And so, I came back from Omaha with uh, all these sketches, and then Bristol. Ta-da! <laughs> so, whoo, I did that special logo on the train. And <laughs> just so I wanted to get on side with you all. So, uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, Ver Verity mentioned we had this excellent Twitter-thon where um, Laura from Clifton Suspension Bridge uh, invited, um, said, come, come and have a play on the bridge. And so I started coming and visiting Bristol. And for me, this was really exciting because Bristol's where my dad was from and I really wanted to get to know the city. And so um, I'd come along and I'd sketch and I'd try to imagine what would it be like to uh, um, create a sort of immersive performance on the bridge and what if the bridge becomes time itself and by walking along the bridge, you can walk through the composition. If you stay still, you remain in a time loop. So starting to think of all these kind of quite creative ideas trying to work out what is the kit that we need. Um, and then uh, also um, doing sound recordings as well. Tom, what's the time? So um, we decided to try using accelerometers to, to measure the vibrations caused by wind and traffic. And so this is Adam, my 
friend and collaborator um, uh, taking all the sort of data from the accelerometer and then um, doing some clever coding and then making it sound. <laughs> so it's just... One thing that we came away from that was like we just didn't know what the hell we were hearing. You know what was that? And we suddenly realised that we needed to understand physics a bit more. And so um, I started coming to the bridge, and um, this is a lovely illustration by Alicia Millo from Queen Mary University. And we started doing some research into the shape of the bridge and um, the length of the hangers, and started noticing that um, the first hanger, if you go along 12, the 12th one is half the length of the first, which is kind of quite a musical thing. Say. On a, um, so potentially this could be a 12-tone octave. And so we were all quite excited by this. And so then the next thing was working with um, Roland from Arup, who's in the audience, and um, I decided to um, test this theory with Roland by getting a heavy rubber dog's wall and um, donging, not that heavy Laura from the suspension bridge, and donging, <laughs> <laughs> and donging each um, hanger. And um, Roland, um, so did you attach an accelerometer? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and these are the sounds that we got, the Clifton scale. If I were to make you sit through it all, you'd realize it gets higher at the end, but I'm not going to because there's no time. And so um, we messed around with it and added a bit of reverb. It sounded really interesting. Um, then I started doing experiments, working out how we could self-hoist all of our new kit up the hangar and um, developed, um, I realized there's a dog theme going on. So <laughs> this dog toy and carabiners, and then got a, a window cleaning hoist to shove it up, because then we didn't need a scissor lift or anything like that. And then you could just be go gorilla and attach to bridges without the need of a team. And then the next thing was, OK, we need to start fashioning some of these um, amazing donging devices. So in step um, Arup. And um, so they've been amazing. So um, Alan, Ian, and um, Roland from Arup have been helping <coughs> us develop these kind of mechanical bowing devices. And so we'd meet at their studio. This is a, a fake picnic <laughs> that we did to, um, for a film, because we've got a, a, a guy called Jesse who's making a film about this. So we, were, we did a, a craft session, kind of Blue Peter style, on the lawn uh, on the, in front of the bridge there and put together um, the very first bridge bow, which Roland tested. There's me hoisting it with the, the window cleaning pole. And it worked, which was really exciting. Then we got excited by the idea of, um, you know, really, this is almost becoming a piano. And so looking at the, um, perhaps, visiting Steinway um, and, and finding out if maybe they could get involved and help us design the, the kind of donging devices. And so, um, Fast forward, um, then more meetings with Ar Arup, um, and we made the second iteration of our bridge bow, which could then twist. So depending on where you're, you're stood, um, it will twist and, and turn and face you. So meanwhile, um, our, the tech team, so Seb and also our, our industrial designer, David, um, were working on the new Digibow Mark III. And so um, Seb did a wizard job with making it look incredible. And, um, and, and David too, and, and it's working really well. Um, so we're kind of up to that stage with that at the moment. And so this is the entire new kit for Clifton. Bridge bow, digital bow, which is almost becoming like a, almost like a wah-wah pedal or something uh, that you could change, the, you could do whatever you wanted, pitch, reverb, volume. And then also a, a speaker where, where the sound um, that you're playing resonates from the source of the sound, um, the hanger itself. So here's all the kit. Um, and then, meanwhile, I'm going to fast forward. Here's our new trailer.